So we are continuing with our never-ending sermon series on Jude. And today we are going to cover verse 21. Can I have the slides, please? Verse 21, and the title of uh, today's uh, message is Keep Yourselves in God's Love. And uh, we're also going to look at another passage um, from John 15, um, verse 9 to verse 11. And I'm going to ask uh, Jane, Jane to come and read for us. Yeah? Let's welcome Jane uh, Can I have the mic? Where's the mic? Okay. Can see you. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remained in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jude 21, John 15, verse 9 to 11. Okay, thank you very much. So we would like to be an intergener intergenerational church and uh, everybody can participate from the very young to the very old uh, in our worship service. It's always a joy to see Jane uh, dancing before the Lord uh, together with her mummy. It's always such a joy. Yeah. Something about children when they worship, there's such an innocence, there's such an authenticity that we can learn from them. It's not moving. Can you can you help me? Yeah, it's on already. Yeah. The Bible teacher and commentator F. B. Meyer. He once told a story about two Germans who wanted to climb the Matterhorn. And so they hired three guides and they began their ascent at the steepest and most slippery part. The men roped themselves together in this order. Guide, traveller, guide, traveller, guide. Five of them. And they had gone only a little way up the side when the last man, when the last man lost his footing and he was held up temporarily by the other four because each had a toe hole in the niches they had cut in the ice. But then the next man slipped and he pulled down the two above them. The only one to stand firm was the first guide. Why? Because he had driven a spike deep into the ice. Because he held his ground, all the men beneath him regained their footing. You know, we are living in end times, really. I was in a conversation with uh, someone just yesterday, he was from England, and he said he couldn't live in England anymore. He couldn't go back to England. The England of today is not the England he grew up in. He said England had lost its Christian call. It's all gone. We are living in end times. We are living in the age of apostasy. Jesus said that his disciples. In Matthew 24, he said, in the end times, many will turn away from the faith. Many. 
They will betray, they will hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many, deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And Jesus said, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Have you got your spike driven deep into the foundation, into the rock, Jesus? Because in this end times, it is challenging and we might fall away. We might fall away. And so Jude said to the people, to the recipients of his letter when he wrote this, he has this very urgent message. And basically he tells them, contend for your faith. You need to fight. You need to fight for your faith. No one else will do it for you. The world will not do it for you. In Genesis, we are told God created man and woman. Today, I read of a young person belonging to the woke generation. They are proud to say, I belong to the woke generation because I have awakened. My eyes have enlightened. And he said, there are 47 genders. It's unbelievable. And it's amazing to me. I, I followed some Senate hearings when, you know, senators, uh, uh, when U.S. senators asked college, university professors to define what is a woman. They cannot do it. They refuse to do it. We are living in end times. We need to contend for the faith. Nobody will do it for us. Not the university professors. Not the university presidents. They won't do it for us. Not the YouTubers and the social influencers. We have to fight. That's the urgent message. Contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Jesus says, there are four things you need to do. You need to do four things. And we've looked at the first two. First one, he tells them, you need to build yourself up in the most holy faith. You need to grow. You need to mature. You need to know God. You need to draw closer to Him. You need to be strong in your faith so that you will be anchored. You will be rooted in Jesus. You will not be shaken by the storms of life. You will not be shaken when you face persecution and hardships. When people betray you, you will stand. And Jude says the second thing you must do is you must pray in the Holy Spirit. You must pray what is consistent with the Spirit's will, His desires, His directives, His decrees. Submit to the Holy Spirit. Pray as guided by the Holy Spirit. And today we look at the third thing Jude says we must do. We must keep ourselves in God's love. We must keep ourselves in God's love. I want to say this. You know, Jude is not telling the believers that they need to keep themselves saved. He's not telling them that. He's telling them to keep themselves in the love of God. There are two verses that we need to pay attention to. At the beginning of the letter and at the end of the letter, Jude tells us this. God is our keeper. I am so comforted by that. God keeps you. God holds you in the palm of His hand. God is our keeper. And in verse 1, Jude 
uh, in his salutation, he, he says this, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to those who have been called, you, you have been called, and who are loved in God the Father. You are loved. My brothers and sisters, you are loved. And kept for Jesus Christ. Some translation says kept by Jesus Christ. Is it too small? Can see or not? Can now. Jude says you are kept for Jesus Christ. And it can also be translated, you, can, you are kept by Jesus Christ. And at the end of his letter, Jude says, in his doxology, in his benediction, uh, benediction, he says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, keep you from stumbling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault. And with great joy. Blameless, without fault, and with great joy. God is our keeper. God is our keeper. The words kept in verse 1 and keep in verse 24, they are the same Greek word, terios which comes from another Greek word, teros, which means a God. God maintains and preserves us. What a joy. What a joy. And so when, when Jude says, keep yourselves in God's love, he's not saying keep yourself safe. It's just that remain in God's love. And the Bible translator by the name of West, he translated... Uh, this, this verse as with watchful care. How? With watchful care, keep yourselves within the sphere of God's love. So what Jude in essence is saying, keep yourself in the place, in the place where you experience the blessings that God's love brings. Stay there. Do not move away from there. Or else the consequence will be disastrous. One Bible commentator by the name of William MacDonald, he made this uh, observation. He said, the love of God can be compared to sh the sunshine. The sun is always shining. But when something comes between us and the sun, we are no longer in the sunshine. When something comes between us and the sun, we are no longer in the sunshine. I want to ask you this question. Can God stop loving you? Only Pastor Elvin dare to say no. Can God stop loving you? Can you ever do anything that will stop God from loving you? Jesus tells a story about God's amazing love. This writer from Desiring God, John Bloom, you know, he dramatized Luke 15. 11 to 32, the parable of the lost son into a dialogue between the younger brother and the older one, which he named Ben and Judah. He did this because he wanted to enter into the parable to understand, to dig out every nugget of truth and insight. And today, I'm going to ask three of our young people to come and dramatize the parable of the lost son for us, okay? So come, Jane will be the narrator. Come, Jane. Okay, Jane, yeah, all right. And the uh, younger brother is uh, Isaac. Come, Isaac. Come. 
And the older brother is Josiah. He wanted to be the older brother, okay? Yeah, wow. Okay, so they are going, they, they never practice, all right? They have not practiced at all, okay? But they are going to dramatize uh, this parable that we are all very familiar with, prodigal, okay? All right, I'm going to put it on the screen so you can follow along. Ben, ben paused to quiet the sobs that wanted to come. I want you to know how sorry I am for what I have done to you and to that and to the family's honor through my, my terrible selfishness. For a few moments, Judah said nothing. Then, looking back down the road, he said, The day you left, this is where Dad stood, watching you till you were out of sight. And he came back here so often that I started calling this place Prodigal's Point. If someone couldn't find that, I'd say check Prodigal's Point. He never stopped hoping he'd see you coming back home. I'd have my hand to the plow, and then I'd see him up here, gazing into the distance, hoping to see you. It used to really irritate me. You know why? Ben shook his head. If you had asked me at the time, I would have said it was because Dad staring down the road wasn't going to bring you back, that he was wasting valuable time. But that wasn't the real reason. It made me angry because when I saw Dad longing for you, it felt to me like he missed you more than he appreciated me, like he didn't value all I was doing for him, like he didn't think our relationship was special like I did. Judah paused, looking at the ground. You know, I asked Dad once why he wasn't more angry with you. He said it was because the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I took this as that, avoiding coming to terms with what you did and trying to use scripture to make it look holy. So I reminded him that other scriptures clearly show that God gets angry over sin, and so should we. To which he said something like, When men get angry, God's righteousness is rarely seen. I said to him, So we are never supposed to get angry? Ben can walk off to only God knows where with all that money you work so hard for. Blow it on horse and whatever else, and we're not supposed to get angry. We're just supposed to bow our head and meekly pray that God brings him back home. I don't think so. That said, I'm not saying we shouldn't be angry, but the scriptures say, be angry and do not sin. I wanted to pull my hair out. Tell me what you think that's supposed to mean, Dad. I don't think I'll ever forget what his answer was. He said, Jude, I've been trying to figure that out for decades. And honestly, I don't know if I'm getting the balance right with Ben. But what I do know is this, if God's mercy and grace and steadfast love makes him slow to anger towards his sinful children, of which I am one, then when my children say, that's what I want them to experience from me. Thank you very much. You're supposed to hug your younger brother now, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Isaac. Yeah, you can keep it, right? Can God stop loving you? Can you say yes without a doubt? We all know this story. The younger son wants to be independent. He wants to see the world. He asks for his share of inheritance and the father, the father grants him his request. You know what, what this means? This is 
a picture of God letting a sinner go his way. And my brothers and sisters, even though God is loving, even though God will do his very best to stop us from straying, but if we insist, he will say, have it your way. And the younger son departs from the place of love. He distances himself from his father, from the source of love. He removes himself from his father's protection and his father's provision. And he finds out that his foolish ambition to be independent is a one-way road to a life of disappointment and dissatisfaction. He left, but did the father stop loving him? Did the father stop loving him? He did not. That's Jesus' point. He did not. He stood and watched, anticipating, hoping for the return of his lost son. I want us to really, really get this from this story. Lost son, but not lost sonship. He did not cease to be his father's son. God will never stop loving us. God says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. But we can get out. We can get out, we can depart, we can distance ourselves from God's love. So the problem is us. The problem is us. We stray away and we find ourselves in a place where we, in a risky place where our faith can be compromised. Jesus says, he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And that's why Jude says, in this time of great apostasy, of people falling away, in the time of increase in wickedness, Jude says, keep yourselves in God's love, within the sphere of God's love. And I want us to look at John 15, because Jesus tells us how we can remain in God's love. How we can keep ourselves in God's love. You know, Jesus said in John 15 verse 9, He said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Jesus says to every one of us, remain in my love. Remain in my love. And he tells us the key to remaining in his love. Obedience. Obedience, because in the very next verse, in verse 10, Jesus says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. So keeping ourselves in God's love means what? Obedience. It means keeping God's commands. 
I don't know about you, but obedience is a problem for me. I constantly struggle to obey God completely. I struggle. As for keeping God's commands, difficult. Love your enemy, very difficult. Be angry, but do not sin, very difficult. I find God's commands, some of them, very challenging, difficult, impossible, and not much fun. Not much fun, right? And we find God's command sometimes to be burdensome. Be generous or burdensome, God. Very difficult. I'm struggling already. Be patient. Be gentle. So difficult, God. Submit to authority. Terrible, God. How? God, you know what my boss is like. If we find God's commands to be burdensome, the Apostle John disagrees with us very strongly. He says, no, it's not. And he says this, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not, are not what? Burdensome. His commandments are not Burdensome. You know why it's difficult to obey? Obeying God is a love thing. You think about it, it's true, it's a love thing. The problem is this, if I cannot obey God, it's because of love. I do not love Him. I do not truly love Him. It's a love thing. If you have a problem with obedience, it's a problem of you not being able to love God. And the problem of you not being able to love God, I will tell you afterwards what, what it is. We will find keeping God's commands to be burdensome when the motivation to obey is other than love. If it is not love, we are motivated by love, then it will be burdensome. How can you love your enemies? Burdensome, unless you're motivated by love. It is a love thing. And we see that in the older brother. We know the story when the younger brother came back, the father threw a party. He was just over the moon with joy. But the elder brother became angry, refused to join the party, refused. The father came out and pleaded with him. And this is what, we all know what the, the older brother said. He said, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. He was indignant. But let's look at the older brother's obedience. For him, it was burdensome. Look at the words that the older brother uttered. All these years, I've been slaving for you. Burdensome. And he obeyed not out of love, but for reward. Because he said, I never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me. He was not motivated by love, but by reward. 
You know what I believe his problem was? He didn't know his father loved him. Even though his father loved him, he did not know, he did not experience his father's love. I think this is very significant. When Jesus put this into the story, his, the, the father said, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But he did not know that. And so his obedience was not out of love. He wanted to earn his father's reward. Do you know his problem? That's his problem. If we have a problem with obeying God, for keeping his commands, know today it is a love problem. We all know this verse. Our, our host team, they have it, they wear it on their t-shirts. John says we love because he first loved us. We are not able to love if we do not know that. If we have not experienced that, if that is not a reality, if today you have not really opened your heart to experience God's love, if today there, there are mental blocks that tell you God could not possibly love you, I pray they will be removed. John also said, this is love, not that we love God first, but that He loves, not that we love God, but that He loves us. It's amazing when I think about how God can love me. God's love comes first. And our love for Him is a response to His love. My brothers and sisters, let us intentionally, let us prayerfully reflect on the greatness, on the magnitude of God's love for us. And the more we experience that, the more we will be able to cultivate an obedience to Him, a desire to please Him, a desire to do His will. You know what Jesus said? He said, if you love me, keep my commands. John 15, 14. John, John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commands. And whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. You, you can not put it any simpler than that. Jesus loves me, this I know. It's so powerful. You know, in verse 9, John 15, Jesus says this, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. How has Jesus loved us? How does he love us as the Father has loved him? In John 3, verse 35, Jesus made this um, statement. He said this, The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. And I want us to see the, the similarity. What the Father told the older brother, My Son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. 
everything I have is yours, but the older brother did not, the older son did not understand that, did not fully experience that. So in his heart, he couldn't love the father. He couldn't love his younger brother. But we have Jesus, and Jesus says, the father loves me and has placed everything in my hands. And that is why Jesus was able to obey the Father. How does Jesus love us? How would you describe the love of Jesus? It's a perfect love. Complete, total, uncompromising, unfailing, unending, sacrificial love. No greater love than this. Jesus did not just say, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. He demonstrated that. In verse 13 of John 15, he said, Greater love has no man, no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. So when Jesus tells his disciples to obey his commands, to keep his commands, he points to himself as the model for them. Verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. Jesus, when he was here on earth, he had to remain in his father's love. He could have stepped away from his father's love when he was tempted in the desert to turn stone into bread. He could have, uh, you know, given in to the challenge of the devil to throw himself. But he remained in his father's love by keeping his father's commands. For Jesus to remain in his father's love, he had to obey. If Jesus had to obey, I don't think we can have any excuse not to follow his example. John 5 is an amazing chapter. Jesus said, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. Obedience, keeping God's commands. Philippians 2, we read that Jesus became obedient unto death. And in the garden of Gethsemane, you know what he prayed? He could have stepped away from his father's love, but he said, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And in verse 11, Jesus says, if you obey, you will have joy. You will get joy from obedience. Verse 11, John, uh, 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 Jesus says, I have told you this. What is this? Look at verse 10. If you keep my commands, you will love me. If you love me, you will keep my commands. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. How long, my brothers and sisters, do we, you know, become satisfied or think that 
you know, unspeakable, total, overflowing joy is not possible. It is not possible because of us, not because of God. Jesus says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. There is joy in obeying God's commands. Just now Raymond said, God loves a cheerful giver. Do you enjoy tithing? Some people say, give until it hurts. No. Give until you laugh uncontrollably with joy. Then you can give. Someone once asked me, I've already retired, I've got no income, do I still have to pay tithe? That one you asked Dr. Thomas Chin. No? You know, my brothers and sisters, when we obey God's commands, someone will benefit from our kindness, from our generosity, from our willingness to forgive. You know, and when we see the joy that God can bring to other people because of our obedience, we experience joy. That is why it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's a spiritual principle. If you cannot feel that you are more blessed when you give, huh, then I will tell you this, you have not given enough. You have not given enough. Obedience to God is not burdensome, it's not drudgery, because it comes from love, it is founded on love. Jesus says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Love. Love is the overarching theme, descriptor, that Jesus uses to describe the nature of his obedience to the Father. He obeyed the Father because he loves the Father, because the Father loves him. And we obey God's commands because Jesus has loved us and because we love him. Love. And we grow in our love for God as we obey God's commands. You know, we will not, God will not love us more if we obey Him. I want you to let this truth sink in. God will not love you more if you obey Him. But I tell you this, you will experience Him more. You will experience Him more. My brothers and sisters, when we remain, when we, when we are obedient to God, we not only demonstrate our love for God, we abide in the love of God. We live in the love of God and we receive and we experience every blessing that comes from abiding in the love of God. That is why Jude says, keep yourselves in God's love. Stay there. Stay there. I want to end with a story. This story was told by a man who went to a beautiful beach in Australia, renowned for its surfing. And when he was there, he, he came across a group of very angry surfers. And one of them said to him angrily, he said, look out there, can you see the barrier? And when, when the man looked more closely, he could see a barrier stretching across the entire mouth of the bay, right where the large enticing waves were breaking. The barrier appeared to be made of a heavy mesh, 
and was supported by floats on top of the water and according to surface, it dropped all the way down to the ocean floor. And as this surfer became more animated and angry, this, this man noticed an older man listening and growing impatient as he listened to all these complaints. Finally, this older man rose, walked to the group, took out a pair of binoculars and handed them to one of the surfers and he pointed out toward the barrier and said, take a look. And each of the surfers took a look using the binoculars. And when the turn for this man who told the story, when his turn came, he said, with the help of magnification, I could see something that I had not been able to see before. You know what? Dorsal fins. Large sharks feeding near the reef on the other side of the barrier and the group, the angry, impatient, complaining, grumbling group suddenly became subdued. The old man took his binoculars and turned to walk away and as he did, he said these words, don't be too critical of the barrier. It's the only thing that, that's keeping you from being devoured. A changed perspective. A barrier that had seemed rigid and restrictive that seemed to curtail the fun and excitement of riding the really big waves had become something very different. With new understanding of the danger that lurked just beneath the surface, the barrier now offered protection, safety, and peace. This morning as I got down from the car, You know, I remembered this verse from Proverbs 19, verse 16. I, I don't have it on the slide. Listen. Whoever keeps commandments, Proverbs 19, 16. Whoever keeps commandments keeps their life. Let me say that again. Whoever keeps commandments keeps their life. But whoever shows contempt for their ways will die. When we keep God's commands, we keep ourselves inside the sphere of God's love. We remain in God's love and we enjoy every blessing that comes from God, from His love. You know, God's commands sometimes are seen like the barrier. Difficult to understand, rigid, unyielding, blocking our path. Blocking our way into experiencing something fun and exciting that other people are doing. But my brothers and sisters, as the Apostle Paul says, we see through a mirror dimly, cannot see very clearly. We have limited perspective and often we cannot comprehend the great dangers hidden just below the surface. Jude warns his, the believers about the dangers of falling away. He says, contend for your faith. He says, keep yourselves in God's love. You know, in John 15, and I want to say this, I believe this is the Spirit speaking. You know, Jesus says, if you Keep my commands, you will remain in my love, right? 
And down that chapter, he mentions specifically one command. One command. He picks that out. John 15, 17. You want to know what that command is? This is my command. Love each other. You know, there are some of us here who are angry. Angry with our brothers, angry with our sisters. We feel aggrieved, we feel hurt, we feel that we have been treated unjustly. And maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. You have been treated unfairly. But today Jesus says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. And this is the command, love each other. How can we not love? How can we not forgive? When we think that God forgave us, God forgave us while we were sinners, we were not good people, but God forgave us. God loves us. And even if we think we are okay, we are not bad people. But still, we are not able to come up to the standards of perfection that God requires. How can we not love? How can we not forgive? It's difficult. It's a journey. It's a process. But you need to say, I choose to love. I choose to forgive. You know, I was preparing to address my school assembly and I, and you all know this quote from this Chinese philosopher. I don't, don't, don't know how to pronounce his name, Lao, Lao Tzu or Lao Tzu or whatever. But he said this, the journey of a thousand miles begins with step one step and my brothers and sisters that first step is the most difficult it is the most difficult you know for the last eight nine days I have really struggled so much because I saw how depraved, how dirty, how unworthy. I could see the filth in my heart. I could say I had an Isaiah moment. And I wonder how, how God could love me. An amazing thing is God loves me. Jesus says, love each other. Jude says, keep yourselves in God's love. And we do that by obedience. And really, if God is saying to you, you need to love someone, the person that has hurt you, I pray God will give you the grace and the strength to take that first step. It is going to be a journey. It is going to be difficult. But you must take the first step so that the joy of God may be in you and that this joy may be complete. I want us to sing this song, The Goodness of God. And I want us to know that God is so good. God's goodness chases us, runs after us. We love because He first loved us. 
Let us pray first. God, I just want to pray that even as we have heard the words of our Savior, Jesus, where He tells us to remain in Him, where He tells us that just as the Father has loved Him, He has loved us. Such an amazing thing, Lord. And He tells us to remain in His love. And that if we keep His commands, we will remain in His love. And He has shown us the example because He Himself kept His Father's commands. Thank you, Lord. I pray today that many hearts will be set free from the prison of being unloving, of being unforgiving and unkind. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your love is unfailing. We're just so grateful. We sing the song.